Data Skeptic is the official podcast of dataskeptic.com, bringing you stories, interviews, and mini episodes on topics in data science, machine learning, statistics, and artificial intelligence. Today on Data Skeptic, we're going to talk about the Open House Project. Longtime listeners will know some of the history of this. A while ago, Linda and I were looking to buy a house, and I found myself disappointed to not have easy access to the data on home sales that would be complete enough to run some regressions. We were about to make the most significant financial choice of either of our lives without ready access to the exact data that might help us inform our decision. But data about home sales is public, isn't it? You can Google just about any address and get details. Indeed, on a one-off basis, it's relatively easy to use Google for research. But what if I want a much larger sample of transactions in the last few years on a specific block? This episode is the story, to date, of Open House, a project that seeks to liberate transactional-level home sales data for data scientists, sociologists, economists, and the generally curious, enabling easy access to transactional home sales data. In this episode, I talked to a few of the volunteers who helped out with the project. Let's start with Zareen, who helped out a lot during our research phase when we were still hoping to tap into some obscure but complete data source. The goal of the research that I did so far was to catalog all the open housing data that currently exists and determine whether its licensing would allow us to reuse it and bundle it for the open house project. So I researched some of the most popular housing websites to determine what their source of data is, whether they offer any open source data sets to the public, and if so, to what granularity, and also to see if they have an API for developers to use. So what I learned was, first of all, there's some very fundamental differences in what these different sites were doing. Some of the websites are simply listing services, which serve as an advertising platform for either homeowners or agents. Some of the sites are government sites, which are all public record. Some of them are closed to the public completely and are only available to brokers and real estate agents. I found that this data was It's not very easily publicly accessible, and the data that is accessible is not similar. So it's all different data sets at all different granularities. And also, the data that is available is not historical. So there's no way for me to look at the same house's value every week or every month or every time it's sold and do any kind of time series analysis with it. How granular was the data that you were able to find at some of those sites? Could anything get down to the exact sort of housing transaction level you and I were both looking for? No, it didn't. So there definitely is a lot of open data, but the and there's different ways to slice it. So you can slice it by state, by city, zip code, or neighborhood, but none of these sources let me actually get down to individual home granularity. And everything I found was just metadata. We've gotten a few questions from the public asking why Open House exists. Isn't this already available? Real estate data is a bit like some optical illusions. If you don't take the time to look at it intently, it might appear as though there's more to it than there is. The prominent sites that provide data tend to make it available, as Zareen said, at best in some rolled up aggregation. That doesn't help us if we want to calculate something like the added value the market assigns to an extra bedroom or something like that. Even still, maybe we could validate our data with these aggregations, so long as we can access them programmatically via API. With the sites that I looked at, I found about a 50% split between sites that were offering APIs and then sites that didn't. For example, Trulia, which when I did this research, they did offer an API, but it's been decommissioned. Zillow does offer an API, but the data that they release to the public is metadata. And, you know, like we mentioned, it's not to the level of granularity we want. But there's also some really interesting clauses in Zillow's terms of use, which kind of restrict our use of it. They state that users are not able to retain copies of Zillow's data, but can simply make API calls to the Zillow server and then immediately render that data to your users. So you're also not allowed to show your users Zillow's data in bulk, but only on a transactional basis. So this poses a real problem to a project like Open House. 
And then some of the sites that I researched that didn't have an API, or actually all of those sites didn't show any signs of moving towards APIs. So I don't think that's going to be an option anytime soon. Craigslist, for example, is one of those sites that's really restrictive with their data. They don't have an API, and they actually explicitly ban web crawlers from scraping their data. Let's take a step back here and learn more about Zareen, as well as our other two guests today that you haven't heard from yet, Samira and Joy. I've been sitting on these interviews for a little bit, so the bios may have atrophied a bit, but let's hear from everyone nonetheless. So about eight months ago, I quit my software sales job to transition careers and get into data analytics. So for the past couple of months, I've been teaching myself Python, SQL, data visualization, statistics, and some other technical topics like basic web development and AWS. Mainly, I've been learning just by hacking on my own projects for fun. Oh, very cool. Any uh, projects you want to highlight or send people to? One of my favorite was a word to vec implementation for the Harry Potter text series. Uh, I built a website where you type in a word, any word from the Harry Potter books, and it pops out the seven most similar words from the Harry Potter books. So it was just a fun project to get to know a really interesting machine learning algorithm. I put a link to Zareen's project in the show notes. I have to admit, I couldn't really get on board with the whole Harry Potter thing. I'm more of a J.R.R. Tolkien guy, I guess. But Zareen's project is still interesting, so you should check that out. We're going to do an episode on word to vec eventually. It's a really neat algorithm, and she has a cool demo of it. Let's meet Samir. I'm a technology evangelist at Databricks where I help promote the adoption of Apache Spark. I do this by teaching classes at conferences, local meetups, writing blog posts, and recording YouTube videos. Do you have a quick reference I can put in the show notes and on the show for where people could learn about how they might develop their Apache Spark skills with you? Yeah, the very best place is to check out the official Spark documentation, which is at spark.apache.org. So I'm here with contributor Joy. To get started, maybe can you tell me something about your background specifically related to data science and the technology? Yeah, sure. So I've been a data scientist at Intuit for two and a half years, and my day-to-day work mostly has to do with doing ad hoc analyses on the data that came into um, Intuit products, basically working off of data in relational databases, taking them and then doing supervised learning mostly, using tools like SQL Python and Spark. I've been enjoying doing that a lot. Before that, I was an Inside Data Science Fellow. This is a seven-week postdoc program that help transition PhD data scientists into, or PhD scientists into industry data science. So we basically um, get together and come up with data-driven projects and try to use a combination of data analytics as well as machine learning to try to come up with uh, data-driven products. And then we make presentations and go interview with different company in industry. Before that, I did a PhD um, in bioengineering at MIT, and my work has to do with contour tracking in images and trying to apply hidden Markov model on the objects that I was tracking. On the side, I worked on a personal sort of like biometric tracking project. So I was looking at job on data of one person, which is myself. And then I tried to build visualization based on that. And that is my segue into industry data science. Okay, with everyone introduced, let's get back to the discussion at hand. Why is it difficult to find detailed data sets on home sales? From my research, I have not been able to find any suitable source which would meet all our needs. So I would say that open house as a project absolutely needs to exist because there's no other way to get this data. It looks like we'll just have to continue working on this. You also did some really high-level research that I think gives us some good mile markers we want to shoot for. For example, can you tell me about some of the statistics you collected, like how many homes are in the United States? According to the U.S. Census data, as of July 2015, there were 134.8 million homes. For reference, 
In April of 2010, there were 131.8 million homes. And they're spread across about 3,000 counties. You know, some states like Delaware have three counties, while Texas has 250. Every county has its own website. But, you know, as engineers and data scientists, we want to study this U.S. housing market for historic trends and making predictions for which areas might be hot to move into in the future. To do this, though, we ideally need like a single file or database that has all of the data for 135 million households. But the problem is that the data is scattered across as many as 3,000 different websites. So there's a challenge in crawling all of these websites and centralizing all of that data into one location. It seems one of the most reliable sources of data, in the U.S. anyway, are county records. They track all home sales data for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is confirming ownership and establishing taxes. We've had a good deal of success so far accessing data provided by some counties. However, not every county is online with this data. Those that are tend to have it in different formats and ways of accessing it. In theory, all of these data people at counties could get together and decide to do something called federation. Federation is a process in which similar services, even sometimes competitive services, all agree to a standard data format for exchanging data from one place to another. There isn't really any federation for this data. The closest thing that's out there is the MLS. MLS stands for Multiple Listing Service. The MLS is pretty much the primary source for all real estate listings for agents. So essentially, if a house isn't listed on MLS, it's not for sale. Small nitpick correction here, the MLS doesn't necessarily include properties that are for sale by owner or FISBOs. I'm sure there are other corner case exceptions as well, but generally speaking, yes, any property actively for sale is probably on the MLS. The MLS is a proprietary service, and it's not open to the general public. It's only accessible for brokers or agents, so normal people don't have access to MLS feeds. Even if you are a broker, you can only pay to have access to listings in a certain region. So for example, if I'm a broker in Boston, I'm probably only paying for listings in Massachusetts or maybe a couple of other states in New England, and I don't have access to the entire U.S. home listing data set. So if I wanted to look at a listing in Florida, I would have to pay more to get access for Florida listings. Another problem with MLS is that there's no single authoritative MLS and there's no universal data format across the regions. So even if this data did become openly available to everybody, there would really be no easy way for developers to access this information. Right, so there's a definite gap we identified with Open House. The entire project is aimed at filling the gap left by the absence of federation. We seek to find, centralize, standardize, and broadly liberate this data to be more useful. The efforts fall into four general areas. First, we need to find sources of data, then crawl them, then parse out the information, and lastly, make that data available to people. You can access our data via our API or via our front end. Let's get back in touch with Joy to talk about the front end. What kind of technologies and software and packages and tools and things like that are you using in the work that you're contributing to Open House? When I first started helping out with open house, I was just looking for something to do. And at the time, I think we need help on doing the front end. So I jumped on. I actually, I'm actually not a front end programmer. I have some experience with jQuery, but I felt like I would like to get back into data visualization. Um, I have some experience with v3.js, so I want to get back in. So I decided to do that. And for that, I used React and D3 to build visualization. And then I use Chrome DevTools for debugging and for collaboration, we use Gitflow. So pretty much sums up, yeah. So Joy and a few other contributors helped us make the choice to use a framework Facebook created called React for our front end. By the way, you can see that front end by visiting gallery.openhouseproject.com. We're calling it a beta release. A few rough edges yet, but overall looking really good. 
I have some experience with Node.js and a lot of people at work um, use Angular.js and I first was uh, looking into Angular.js but I felt like it was such a steep learning curve. And then one of the contributor to Open House uh, mentioned React.js. So I looked into it and I felt like the learning curve is much less steep. So I was watching uh, tutorial videos for a few nights for 30 minutes each night. And then after four or five days, I was able to already start coding in React, which is really exciting. The one benefit is that there's not much of a learning curve for React. The code base is modular, so it's component uh, focused. So I think that allows the team to be able to divide up the code component by component and then basically work independently and then integrate the work back together. Also, um, because of this, I think it's also easier for new members to contribute uh, new components to the front end. Why don't I take a minute and talk about the general architecture of our system? I've been talking with Joy about the front end. Again, that's at gallery.openhouseproject.co. There we provide a web-based interface where users can explore the data that's in our system. There are some search options as well, and a map that you can scroll around on. We've also got this cool feature I'm fond of, where with one click, you can launch a new tab that has R running, with a few starter lines of code letting you do analysis on the data you were looking at. That's it. One click to start interacting with the data programmatically. Searching around on the map is a little slow at present, but we've got plans to speed that up with an intelligent caching layer. If you do explore the map, you'll find that there are many areas with lots of data and other places where we've got little or no coverage at the moment. So we're working hard to fill in those gaps, both here in the United States and hopefully internationally as well, if there's interest from the community. The primary way we're working on filling in more listings is in our backend crawling system and using our API. I'll tell you all about that in a minute, but first, a quick note from today's sponsor. Let's take a break from today's episode to talk about our sponsor, Periscope Data. You know, in discussing open house, it's got me thinking about Periscope Data's map option. I've used a lot of dashboard tools that you can do the basic stuff like bar charts and scatter plots. Of course, Periscope Data has those, but I also like their more advanced charts like the map plot. If you're dealing at all with geolocation data, you've probably got a table somewhere with latitude longitudes in it. Simply select those values from the table in any related data or statistics of interest, and Periscope data does the rest. The data is rendered on a map automatically, and the interactive components allow users to scroll over the map elements and get more details, like the average home price in a zip code, or the number of customers in a city. Take a look at my recent blog post on dataskeptic.com where I show off this feature with some open house data. You'll find a link to that in the show notes. To check out the map charts for yourself, head over to periscopedata.com slash skeptics. You can start a free trial and maybe introduce their dashboards with advanced features like map plotting into your organization. To see if this is the right tool for your team, visit periscopedata.com slash skeptics. So our front end retrieves data from our server via our API. How does the data get to the server? We have the ability to bulk load large data drops people might give us, but time has shown that most of our data comes from individual listings sent to us by contributors. After a while, it became clear that we were going to have to do most of the crawling ourselves, so we built the Open House Web Crawler. So Web Crawler is an internet bot that systematically browses all of the links on a given domain and just like downloads every web page it finds. A very common use case of crawling is indexing, which is what like Google or Bing uses it for, and also scraping, which is what data scientists typically use it for. Indexing is the common use case from Google. It's as web pages are downloaded, important keywords are identified, and then the web pages are cataloged according to that keyword. So they're easy to discover in the future. Scraping is a little different. It focuses more on transforming the unstructured data on the web, which is usually in HTML format, into structured data that can be stored and analyzed by a central database or spreadsheet. A lot of website owners are sometimes, you know, suspicious of web uh, crawlers because they can put heavy traffic on the website. So they often have a robots.txt file that is used to communicate with the bots and request them to crawl only parts of a website or none at all. I want to make one thing clear here. 
At Open House, we intend to be good citizens of the internet. If we crawl a website, we identify precisely who we are with a user agent string. Basically, the same way websites can tell that you're on Chrome or Firefox can be used to communicate that our bot is something different. That format, Samir mentioned, the robots.txt file, it's a convention for telling bots what to do. We respect that. If any domain tells us not to crawl them, we don't. So far, no one has told us to stop, though. What our bot downloads is raw HTML of each web page. Almost every domain name has a different format for its page type, so we're stuck with all these web pages we crawled and needing a way to process them. One of the most popular tools engineers use to scrape the web is URL Lib 3 with Beautiful Soup. Both of these are open source Python libraries that are free to use. URL Lib 3 is a Python module that's used to fetch and download URLs. So now you have thousands of web pages downloaded locally. Then you can use Beautiful Soup to extract out the data from each of those HTML web pages. Beautiful Soup is technically an HTML parser, so you can tell it, find all the links, or find all the links whose URL starts with foo.com, or find the table heading that's got green text, and then give me that text. So this puts valuable data that was once locked up in websites within your reach. The important thing to understand here is that Beautiful Soup does not fetch the web page for you. You have to do that using URL Lib3. One of the easiest ways people can contribute to Open House is to give us links to pages that contain data we don't already have. Help us find sources. Anyone that can use a browser can do that. You can find a way to submit URLs at openhouseproject.co. Your suggestions go into a database, and then we crawl that page and hold the raw data. Then, we need a way to parse out the information on it. That's the second place where volunteers can help. On our contributions page, we have a way that you can help us sort those recommendation links to make sure that they're valid. And if you know or want to learn Beautiful Soup, we also have a contributor page where you can request a page to parse. Write up the 10 to 20 lines of Python code using Beautiful Soup that's usually required, and then submit that code back to us. That's generally a pretty quick contribution. After we have the content and a way to parse it, we then need to execute the code that parses it. We're leveraging an idea called serverless to do this. There are several companies that offer serverless solutions. The one we happen to be using is from AWS, and it's called Lambda. Lambda is a new serverless computing platform from Amazon Web Services that was introduced in 2014. You basically upload your code to Lambda, and then Amazon runs it in response to triggers. A trigger can come from a web browser, like HTTP endpoint, or a mobile application, or another AWS service. And Lambda runs your code only when it's triggered and uses only the compute resources needed. So the cool thing is that you only pay for the compute time you use, and that's measured in 100 millisecond increments. So this is different than the traditional EC2 infrastructure at Amazon, where you get a dedicated server running 24-7 and you usually pay by the hour. I've been having a ton of fun deploying serverless architecture for open house and some commercial projects recently. It's really well suited for a lot of data science projects, and it takes the headache out of DevOps in a lot of ways too. Rather than worrying about our crawler servers crashing because we suddenly have a surge of work, I just have to monitor the queues of work to make sure they aren't getting behind. There's a lot more I have to say about this project. We haven't even talked about the API yet, and I'm a little upset with myself I didn't get a chance to interview Elliot, who was instrumental in building that, or interview Scott, who's been contributing on a number of fronts. If you're interested in hearing about our roadmap or contributing to Open House, join our Slack channel. That's automated now. Just visit dataskeptic.com, click on Contact Us, and you can sign up yourself. In the Open House channel, we can tell you all about what's going on and where to review low-hanging fruit tasks that you might be interested in working on. Not sure you have the technical skills necessary to help? Forget about it. Most people that listen to Data Skeptic love to learn as well as teach. Let Open House be your excuse to start flexing a new technical muscle. I talk to a lot of people that want to make a move in their career, but face the catch-22 of needing more experience. Maybe we can help you build and demonstrate your ability as a stepping stone on your career path. We want Open House to reach a point where it has nearly full coverage of U.S.-based home sales and hopefully broad coverage internationally as well. 
We want to be the go-to place for people to look for reliable historic data for research and analytical purposes. But we need the help of volunteers to do this. So drop on by and we'll route you to the contributor webpage that suits your goals and time commitment, however large or small. Okay, a few important announcements before we go. You should listen to these. First up, Los Angeles, California, May 25th. I'm presenting a talk at Zephyr. A link to the meetup page is in the show notes. My talk is on machine learning with audio data. Seattle. I'm going to be at the Microsoft Build event May 10th through 12th, but just attending there. Maybe we'll have a bar night or something. Let me know if you're interested. San Diego. I'm headed your way in June. More details to follow. Linda and I are headed to New York later this year. Please let me know if you've got a space that can host a talk. We may have something in Germany, too. I'll be at Farcon in Minneapolis in August, giving a talk on chatbots and e-commerce. More details there as the time gets closer. I'm booking the rest of the year, so if anyone wants to bring me out to a conference, please let me know so we can lock it in. Lastly, thanks again to Periscope Data for sponsoring this episode. I just uploaded a video to YouTube where I used Periscope Data to build a dashboard with details about the podcast's download numbers. Head over to YouTube and subscribe to the Data Skeptic channel to check that out. Until next time, keep thinking skeptically of and with data. Data Skeptic is a listener-supported program. To support the show, visit dataskeptic.com and click on the membership tab. 